This conference will now be recorded. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this evening. My name is Tavia Record. I'm the president of the Washington, D.C. Baltimore chapter of STC. We greatly appreciate your support. And now I'm going to hand you over to our speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tavia. I appreciate it. Uh, I am Uhura Kunju. Welcome to Plain Writing webinar. I really appreciate your attendance. And uh, I'm just setting my clock here. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by SDC, Washington, D.C., Baltimore chapter. Now, before I begin, I extend my thanks to all of you for attending, but also I'd like to acknowledge two individuals uh, who are uh, have a long list of accomplishments and without whose help uh, I could not prepare this webinar. They are always there when I need them. Uh, Tavia Record, she's our president and professional development program manager and she's kindly uh, moderating this webinar. And Carolyn Kelly Killinger, she is our past president, also an STC fellow. Uh, thank you, Tavia. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm so happy you guys exist. <laughs> uh, this will be a 45 minute presentation followed by 15 minutes Q&A. Uh, given the number of folks and the material we're gonna cover, I will request you hold the questions, you know, take notes and share them through IM, but let's get to them in the QA session. A PDF of the presentation will be available. So don't worry if, if you uh, cannot take note of certain things. And there'll be uh, free bonuses in the end and in the middle somewhere in the, uh, in, during the webinar. Now, who am I? Some of you know me, most of you don't. I'm Ura Kunje. I have an electrical engineering, sociology, print journalism background. One foot in engineering and sciences, the other one in social sciences. I worked in the past as a NATO, Turkish English translator, simultaneous interpreter. I'm a member and past president of our wonderful award-winning chapter, Washington DC Baltimore chapter. And I am an associate uh, fellow of SDC, very proudly. Uh, I'm a Fortune 100 writer. I work for companies like ADP, Fannie Mae, Honeywell. And I live in Maryland and work in Virginia. So I hope this gives a bird's eye view of who I am. Now, plain writing is the law in USA. Uh, it's defined as writing that is clear, concise, and well-organized. Uh, the Plain Writing Act of 2010, it was signed by President Obama and went into full effect October 13, 2011. But that's not the only law uh, that mandates plain writing. Uh, we also have federal rules of evidence, ERISA, RISPA, HIPAA, all that alphabet soup, uh, Credit Card Act of 2009, America's Affordable Health Choices Act 2009, Dodd-Frank Act, Plain Regulations Act. So uh, when we say the law is on our side as tech writers interested in plain writing, uh, it, it is the literal truth. Now, as advertised, uh, we will have eight modules, eight topics to cover. So let's start with the first one three C's of a good technical document. Now, the reason uh, we are interested in plain writing is because we want to write good technical documents. So that forced me to think what, what, what makes a good technical document? What are the characteristics that plain writing supports and makes it feasible, possible? Now, the list is endless, of course. Uh, we all know uh, it has to be logically consistent and it needs to have a good structure, you know, the right images, this and that. But, you know, this list was still not enough for me. I just wanted to boil it down to the DNA, three genes, the uh, sine qua non condition of a good technical document. So this is my list. 
First is correct. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if a technical document is not correct, you can just drop it to the trash can. Uh, I, I personally don't care how well it's written, how nice it looks. It has to be correct. That's the first con condition. But it's not always uh, easy to decide what is correct. For example, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Believe it or not, I used to believe this to be a correct statement. Uh, but it really is not. It's a plain statement, but it's not correct because the water boils at 99.97 degrees Celsius at one atmosphere barometric pressure or at 100 degrees at 1.013 atmospheric pressure. <laughs> In short, water boils at different temperatures at different atmospheric pressures. So this shows both the problematic nature of coming up with something really correct and also the fact that a statement can be plain but still not correct. So uh, what happens if it's not correct? Since I will distribute all these slides in PDF form, you can check out and read yourself. But there's one case of like two word error in Santa Clara, California Water District. They lost like half a that's half a billion dollars, right? 548 million, because they went two words over their summary. Uh, there was an elect, uh, there was an election, so uh, their application, their summary was turned down. And the second error was NASA losing its 125 million Mars orbiter due to English versus metric confusion between the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the other team in Lockheed Martin, you know, uh, one calculated things with the inches, the other folks calculated in metric terms. So uh, the consequences of not being correct can be pretty severe in technical communication and documentation. Uh, a technical document must be clear. For example, under certain conditions, you may be allowed to close the main gate is not clear at all. Much better is close the main gate only when the alarm monitor displays 100 unacknowledged alarm events. Or I, I hate this because I came across so many times, actuate the button. Uh, why not just say press the button? It has to be clear. So a plain statement is a clear statement. This is where uh, plain writing supports uh, good technical communication. The third C is it has to be concise. Uh, look at the problem. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but here uh, the writer is talking about a voltage drop, memory leakage, and there's a test scenario. They have to run it. I, I think all he or she is trying to say is run scenario VB34 to test the memory leak in the software. Uh, and that's the end of it. So a plain statement is a concise uh, statement. So how to be concise and find the core idea is uh, another topic. It's basically a method of uh, elimination and reduction and subtraction. And uh, the things to eliminate include dependent clauses, prepositional phrases, conjunctions, adverbs, switching to uh, eliminating passive voice. We don't have the time, of course, in this webinar to go through all this, but I have a whole course with, that uh, you know, goes into detail of the method of arriving at a concise text. So our second topic is audience analysis. Uh, we heard it many times, thousands of times. Uh, audience is important. We have to write for the audience, right? It's, I think, easier said than done. I mean, in theory, it's as though we have this writer, we have the reader, they know each other. So writer sits down and adopts a style and he or she comes up with something perfect for the reader. But in my experience, especially in a software environment, this is the reality. The writer is reporting to the manager, manager, is inter he interfaces with sales and marketing, then the document ends up with the reader or client, 
And then usually if something goes wrong, a reader calls tech support, customer relations, and then at the end of this cycle, the writer sometimes hears back from tech support, sometimes from manager. It's a very convoluted process during which writer rarely has a very clear idea, I think, who the audience really is. So what do we do about this? We apply strategies, and there are many. And for the purposes of brevity, I will concentrate on just two strategies to make sure what we are writing is the right stuff for the audience. One is the famous readability indexes. There are dozens of them. I just selected a few here. And the second is writing for uh, general audience groups uh, categorized by their general interests. Now, he, here's the same text that uh, we saw a couple slides earlier, and it's simplified version at the bottom. I ran these through three different readability uh, indexes, uh, the flesh Kincaid, uh, Gunning Fog Index, and SMART. So th these are the numbers you see is, is the number of schooling, uh, the grade level the reader must have to understand it. So as you can see, a simple statement requires less schooling. Uh, than a more complicated, uh, longer one. But uh, one thing is, of course, there's no consistency uh, among the scales. And here's the surprising part. I, I ran this test. I basically scrambled the same test. Like, if you try to read it, uh, it, it doesn't even make sense. Uh, because I took the same words and I broke the structure I scrambled to make an omelet. And guess what? Four of the six uh, grades, it, it, these reading and the indexes produce exactly the same results, which goes to show uh, to, to rate low or, or high on any of these indexes doesn't require good quality writing. You can be writing something totally nonsense and still end up. Uh, with a very low score. So we should approach these uh, indexes uh, you know, carefully with caution. Now, SMART, which stands for Simple Measure of Gobbledygook. I took this uh, example from Oxford Guide to Plain English. For example, if they measure polysyllables of words, for example, a three-syllable word like abandon, would score at uh, give a 13.8 score, which is pretty high. But if instead of saying abandon, if you say, if you move away for our good from your home and do not tell us, see, there are one or two syllables and it rates low, 8.1. But the question is, do, do, you, do you want to write this whole sentence in order not to say abandon? So as writers, we have to use our judgments and while uh, simplifying uh, or simplifying our style to make sure they will uh, score low on some index or another. Now, another strategy is writing for an audience. Let's say there are three general uh, categories, general public, business people, scientists, and subject matter experts. And also assume that you are writing about robots or robotics for general public. Now, general public wants to hear something entertaining, maybe with some trivia thrown in their jokes, a general introduction to robotics, which can be written very plainly. And the business people, on the other hand, they want to make money. And they are interested in return on interest on, for example, warehouse automation. It gets little, uh, you have to give them examples of specific implementations and how robotics can benefit their business, at which point the writing probably gets less plain. And the third audience, if you're writing for a group of scientists and subject matter experts, maybe they're interested in something, let's say data-driven dynamic algorithms or some other complicated technical matter, 
And at that point, uh, probably you won't be able to write as uh, plainly as you did for other groups. So again, we can adjust our writings according to the general interest of our audience. Jargon is a special issue. Uh, we know jargon, uh, of course, is not plain writing. And in general, we should stay away from jargon. We heard this many times, but it's a must for some audiences. For example, de-conflicting is perfect for air traffic controllers. If you're writing or speaking to a group of air traffic controllers, if you tell them, uh, take the necessary measures so the airplanes won't crash into each other, they will say, you know, why are you not saying de-conflicting? right so you you will lose credibility and as technical communicators it's important to establish our authority and project a sense of capability and authority and that is possible if when it's time to use jargon you know you use jargon so which is not plain writing or bounce rate if if you're writing for online marketers uh, which means that somebody visiting just a single page in a whole website and then bouncing up some other website. Uh, maybe for people who are not interested in online marketing, they will say, why is she using a jargon? But for marketers, it will be the perfect thing to do. Now, for these strategies, I actually have a course uh, on audience analysis. And I, I go deeper into the topic in my course, and it's available free for you. Uh, you are welcome to it if interested. Our third topic, abstract nouns and verbs. We should avoid abstract nouns and verbs uh, to write plainly. And since I believe uh, showing rather than telling, I wanted to explain this topic uh, by concrete examples. For example, instead of saying we ignore the financial aspect of the solution, aspect is abstract now, we can just say we ignore that the solution would cost us money. I'm not saying these are the only better alternatives. These are mine. You can definitely come up with better ones, but still I think the better alternative gives the uh, idea. The project lacked specificity. I can hardly say it. Instead of specificity, maybe it's better to say the project lacked specific details in just plain English. This is the last implementation instance of this policy. Why not say, this is the last time we are implementing this policy. The alarm system had the wrong system configuration. The alarm system had the wrong settings, much more simpler. Now, here's a, a gallery of abstract nouns uh, for your review. And, you know, you can look at them, uh, you know, in your own time at your convenience. And I would say especially you should watch for words that end in shun, like subordination, implementation, facilitation. Abstract words are the same, like we need to expedite the work process. We need to work faster. Uh, that's much more plain than expedite. The servers were located on the same network to facilitate load sharing. Why not say the servers were located on the same network for easy load sharing. We have to implement, again, another abstract word, a software update. We have to update the software, that's it. Is this going to involve any participation on my part? Uh, I think I, I'm trying to say, well, I have to participate in this. So here's another gallery of abstract verbs for your uh, pleasure, execute, expedite, accomplish, finalize, actuate, realize, implement, on and on. So uh, our job as technical communicators should be to eliminate as many of these abstract nouns and verbs as possible. And at this point, I would like to introduce you this little gem of a book, Oxford Guide to Plain English, 
uh, one of the wonderful books in my library. It is short and sweet, but I highly recommend it. Now, nominalization, another thing to avoid. What is nominalization? It's the bad habit of turning verbs and adjectives into nouns by adding suffixes like shun, meant, etc. Now, trust me, I've been a, a translator and interpreter, so I've been on the both sides of the fence. I mean, these create a lot of problems when you are translating and uh, localizing uh, technical documentation. So the way uh, to eliminate successfully is to find a proper verb uh, to replace uh, a nominalized noun. For example, to have reservations about. I have reservations about this measurement. I doubt this measurement. To make a suggestion, he made a suggestion that we switch the panels. Why not say he suggested we switch the panels? It's much easier to understand and follow. To make a decision, we made a decision to upgrade our software. Why not say we decided to upgrade our software? To lead to something. The experiment led to the destruction of the X45 circuit. Instead, just say the experiment destroyed the X45 circuit. To reach an agreement, we reached an agreement to stop the experiment in August. We agreed simply to stop the experiment in August. To offer, give an explanation for. He offered an explanation for the anomaly. He explained the anomaly. So again, the goal is to be clear and concise and eliminating anomalizations perfectly serves uh, those two core characteristics of a good technical uh, document. Tables. I love tables. Uh, the idea is to reformat text, especially long blocks of text into tables. So it makes them more readable, more understandable, and easier to retain and remember. For example, here's the problem. <laughs> I'm not gonna again read the whole thing, but it's talking about doors, uh, front side, back doors. It's talking about door states, whether a door is locked or not. It talks about voltages uh, and the different sets of voltages, uh, the alarm states triggered by the door. You had to read this thing two, three, four times uh, at least uh, to make a sense of it. But actually, we can express the same thing very plainly. There is a solution to reformat it as a table. And how do we do that? Uh, first, we decide the rows and columns of, of your table. How many rows there should be? And what should be their labels? And how many columns there should be? What should be their labels? Columns, rows. And what should be the values of the cells? where these rows and columns intersect. It's simple as that. Now, identifying the variables in this text, there seems to be two variables here, doors and door states. Then, what values these variables state? Doors have three values, front, side, and back. And so does the door states, lock, release, and alarm. And as to the cell values, very easy. They are all voltages. That's all we are talking about. So the next step here is deciding how your table will look roughly. So in, in this little screen on the back of my forehead, I visualize what roughly the table should look like. So door states uh, horizontally, doors, type of doors vertically, columns and rows, and in the middle, voltages. Once I see that image in my mind, the rest is a piece of cake, as they say. So I just drop in my door states and doors, and I start to populate the cells, just straight through the text. And he, here is the, every cell filled with every value mentioned in, in this indecipherable text. And with a little facelift, 
colors here and there. There you go. It's clear and concise. I, I think this table is uh, uh, is the only way to to make sense out of such a confusing paragraph as the one above. So uh, things to avoid. Uh, it's a really long list, of course, but here's a few that I selected. You can't help but be selective uh, in a short webinar as this one. Now, uh, one thing we should all do is we should, I think, avoid double negatives because double negatives create a lot of cognitive load. It's a load on the mind. It forces us to think. And maybe you heard uh, there's a very great design principle, don't make me think. You know, when, when people start to think about something, it's not transparent anymore. And there's all of a sudden a distance between the reader, observer, and the object that's read and observed. And at that point, you start to lose the other person. Now, something like, you should not operate this machine if its annual maintenance is not finished. I mean, it's like a Rub Rubik's cube. In my mind, you know, gears start to turn immediately. I am now translating these nuts into their affirmative uh, counterparts. But if we say, use this machine only after its annual maintenance is finished, it's so smooth, so straightforward. There, there's nothing to go around and translate into something else. The XYZ switch must not be in the on position if the current is not between three and six volts DC. I mean, there are quite, quite a few statements like that in all kinds of uh, technical documents that uh, makes you start thinking, hmm, this must not be this, the other thing must not be here, etc. But if we write something like XYZ switch must be in the off position, if the current is less than three volts or greater than six volts, there's no negation there, no negatives. I think it's much easier to read, understand, and retain. And that's the whole goal of both plain writing and good technical documentation. So both purposes are served really well. Should, should, I think we should, <laughs> we should avoid should in our writing. Well, we must avoid should, it's much better. Because should indicates a desirable or expected state. It expresses a preferable state of affairs in an ideal world, which can be really dangerous in technical writing. I mean, it can lead to, I, I bet you, a lot of lawsuits because somebody uh, will do or would not do what, what do you think they should do? And uh, like turning a valve on and off at a nuclear power station sort of situation. For example, the wire harness should be tucked away into the B section of the cabinet. Now, one thing, our audience, we are technical writers, they really want leadership and direction from us. Uh, when I'm writing a user manual, I am not really uh, carrying out a, uh, this creative uh, conversation. It's more than a conversation. It is the other person user is looking at me to tell them exactly what to do. They are relying on me. It's a leadership position and should uh, creates ambivalence and it leaves things in an uncertain uh, no man's land, whether to do it or not. But if you say, tuck the wire harness, imperative order mode, tuck the wire harness away into the B section of the cabinet, no more ambivalence. Now, if they don't tuck the wire harness and there's a fire, I can always say, well, judge, I told them to do it. And they didn't. But with should, probably I would have a harder uh, time defending my writing. The card ID numbers should start with 1001. 
they should, but maybe they might as well start with 900, 100. I don't know. There are, see, I'm, I started to think there are question marks. Instead, just say start the card ID numbers with 1001. There are exceptions, of course, when we are referring to an uncertain future uh, in a very natural way. For example, this project should finish by September, or we should be doing very well in, in this market, expresses uh, intention, desire. Uh, we, should, we should celebrate our success in Hawaii. That's a nice suggestion. So when I say we must eliminate should, from our writing, I mean specifically technical writing and not uh, communication in general. Uh, avoid all forms of to be, uh, for example, eliminating it in passive voice construction. It has been noticed that the system pressure dropped by 15%. Just say the system pressure dropped by 15% and there'll be end of the story much more direct way of expressing the same content. Uh, we can replace to be with another verb, to be more informative, to write something more uh, e interesting. Uh, for example, our QA team is good. Yeah, good, but in what way? Uh, are they friendly? Are they working hard? Did they win some awards? What is good? When we say our QA team works hard, Ah, then we know what we mean by good. So it pays to eliminate to be. And there are sometimes is and constructions, like this system is the best available and it'll save us money. If you say this system, the best available, will save us money. As, as a style, I think it is much easier to read and understand and much more straightforward and plain. Avoid variance. This is an important topic I stress in my courses. Why? Because avoiding, eliminating variance builds up uh, user trust and confidence. So, but what is variance exactly? Uh, here are five objects. They have zero variance. Why? Because they are identical in every way. They, they don't vary from one another. Whereas, look at these objects. There's a lot of variance because these five objects vary from one another in every possible way. Uh, shape, size, color, etc. Now, in technical communication, uh, there are straightforward ways to eliminate variance. One of them is, of course, set using the same paragraph styles or the same kind of uh, text elements. Uh, using the same table and figure caption style for all figures and tables in a document. As you can see in this example here, uh, look at table two and table three. So there, there's a lot of variance there. Uh, same thing with headers and footers of all pages or screens in a document, in a help file that again uh, builds up user trust and confidence. Now, a more concrete example. Let's say we are looking at an airplane maintenance manual, and this manual refers to engine turbo components as blades in one page, fan on the next, and air modulators on yet another. I mean, that would be an unreliable manual with really high variance. I don't know if you'd like to fly in an a airplane maintained by a manual like that. I, I, I certainly uh, don't think so. So, uh, plane writing means minimum variance. It's just another uh, general strategy with which to approach our technical document, the documents written uh, plainly. And at this point, I would like to introduce this gem of a book. I mean, one of the, I think, yeah, I, I, without exaggeration, I can say one of the most valuable books in my library. It was written back in 1978. I picked this up from a used bookstore. I was very lucky because it's out of print. 
But last time I checked, Amazon still has a couple used copies. I would say grab it, buy it, borrow it, rent it, last resort, steal it. No, I'm kidding. But this is a wonderful book by Lester S. King. He was uh, the senior editor of Journal of the American Medical Association. Why not say it clearly? A guide to scientific writing. Marvelous book, I highly recommend it. Another book, if you are involved in legal writing of any sort, if you are writing uh, legal briefs, contracts, maybe you are a real estate agent writing contracts, right? or uh, any sort of uh, legal documentation. I think this is a marvelous book, uh, Legal Writing in Plain English with, uh, by Brian Garner. It, it has exercises in it, examples, samples. It's you know, well worth the money to have it in your library. International audience and localization. Now, we sometimes write in English knowing that an uh, international audience will read it. Excuse me. And other, other times we write something in English and it's localized, translated uh, to some other uh, languages. Now, uh, this is a special case when we really should pay a lot of attention to writing plainly and avoiding all the pitfalls. For example, we should avoid all culturally specific expressions like she went ballistic. Why not say she became very angry? This is one tough cookie of a memory leak. Say that this is a difficult memory leak to fix. Uh, the cost, let's not go there right now. The cost, let's not discuss that right now. I mean, to us as English speakers, uh, it, it may not sound like a big deal, but trust me, you know, I've been on the other side of the fence. These are the kind of expressions that create a lot of headaches and a lot of errors in localization translation process. Let's touch base next week. Let's say, let's talk about this next week. Much better. Just wanted to give you a heads up on the system architecture. It's much better to say, just wanted to give you information in advance about the system architecture. I have an issue with that. I have a problem with that. It is much safer. The marketing team had a touchdown, like football illusion. Just say, the marketing team had great success because all people are not familiar with American football. We have to rally the troops in R&D. We have to motivate and encourage the R&D staff. It was a slam dunk solution, basketball fans. It's better to say it was a very easy solution. He knocked it out of the ballpark. Uh, it's much better to say he performed amazingly well. So that's the kind of sentence that you know will translate well. Uh, avoid two or three word verbs like after lowering voltage A down to 4.5 volts, carry on with your system check. Just say continue to check the system. Avoid literary or cultural illusions. Product evangelist. Uh, Adobe uses this a lot and I contacted them, but uh, no, I didn't receive any response. Uh, I guess it's working well for them. Um, talking about marketing crusade. Uh, heart on the sleeve. Pearls before swine, Disney version of something, it takes two to tango, or the last best hope, an offer he can't refuse, Godfather, the usual suspects, again, taken from pop culture. These are uh, sometimes uh, very difficult to translate, and it can come up from the other end in all kinds of weird ways. It's better to avoid them at all. Now, watch your dates. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. Uh, like 2 slash 5 slash 2020 is February 5th in the United States, but it's May 2nd in Europe. Uh, so uh, the, the way I do it, my preference is to say, to write the month, the date, like October 15th, comma, then I write the uh, four digit year 
just to be safe. Now, what your decimal point uh, for, and you know, Europeans use comma for decimal point and we use uh, period, dot. So that's, those are the things that uh, uh, you, you can just, uh, you know, it can just slip through uh, while in the rush of getting the last uh, draft in when we are racing against deadlines. Uh, this is an interesting one. There are a lot of words in English with opposite meanings that can really drive a translator crazy. For example, handicap means both disadvantage and advantage. Left can mean gone or still here. To temper can mean soften or harden, whether it's anger or steel, depending on the object. Transparent sometimes means invisible and or obvious uh, in business context. Oversight can mean to monitor, inspect, or failure to notice. To buckle can mean fasten or collapse. To sanction can mean permit, approve, or condemn, or penalize. So we have to work extra hard uh, not to use such double meaning words and try harder to <clears throat> make our meaning uh, very clear. We should avoid slang or informal expressions like they deep six the evidence when we want to mean they destroyed the evidence. Our developers are burning the midnight oil to meet the deadline. Probably what you are trying to say is our developers are working 60 hours a week to meet the deadline. Now, there are so many phrasal verbs that one day I sat down and I was looking at to take, like a phrasal verbs constructed with to take, and I came up with 50 of, of them. So I was in an energetic mood that day. I sat down and wrote a little ebook. It's on Amazon. I'm not plugging it in. I'd be happy to send you a copy if interested. But there are so many different ways to take something. Like I was taken in by the false voltmeter reading. I was misled. She took apart the circuit board. She disassembled the circuit board is a much better way to express the same idea. I take it the release notes are ready. Well, I assume the release notes are ready. The memory leak took a turn for the worse. The memory leak worsened. Card downloads are taken up a lot of time. We mean cards are downloading very slowly. So again, we have to be very careful the way we are using phrasal words. And the last book of tonight I would like to recommend is The Elements of International English Style by Edmund Weiss. Again, buy, borrow, or rent this book. It's a wonderful uh, addition to anyone's, any technical writer's library. I highly recommend it. And this brings us, folks, to our last module, Writing in Action Units. Now, this is something I want to admit, I made it up myself. There are no, as far as I know, action units is, is not a phrase you come across in any uh, textbooks. By an action unit, I mean a series of consequences arising from the same single action. For example, if you drop an apple, it'll fall, roll on the ground, and come to a rest. All that constitutes a single action unit. In software context, you click a button or a link, it may open a certain window, then change something on the screen, trigger an action, and then the GUI will come to a rest. Nothing will happen anymore. Now, everything that happened after you clicked that button, I call it an action unit. Now, when you write your procedural task steps, especially, finish one action unit in one step for plain writing and easier comprehension. If not, if you break it into multiple steps, which I see you know, happening uh, occasionally or frequently, depending uh, on whose document I'm reading, it increases the cognitive load and it unnecessarily increases the number of steps necessary to explain the procedure. For example, click the open button. This will open the registration screen. Three, 
fill in the first name and last name fields. Now, opening of the registration screen is a direct and inescapable consequence of clicking the open button. So they too belong to the same action unit. That's why we can simplify and write, click the open button to display the registration screen in one step, one action unit, one step, followed by fill in the first name and last name fields. Again, this serves our original core values of being clear and concise. From three steps, we go down to two steps. Another example, six step uh, procedure. Turn the lever to right 90 degrees, keep turning until you hear three rapid beeps, click done on the LED screen. When the verification screen is displayed, enter your ID, click OK, a warning message will display, click the yes button and log off. Now, we can just say, turn the lever to right 90 degrees until you hear three rapid beeps. Why? Because hearing those beeps and turning the lever are the same action unit. Then clicking done LED screen. When the verification screen is displayed, you enter your ID, click OK to display a warning message. Again, we are talking a single action unit. And fourth, click the yes button and log off. As you can see, what, what is previously expressed in six steps now is reduced to four steps. Now, in the remaining uh, one minute, uh, in closing, uh, we went through these eight modules, uh, three C's of a good technical document, how to write for the correct audience, strategies for it, how to avoid abstract nouns and verbs, how to avoid nominalization, how to turn bad paragraphs into tables, things to avoid, writing for an international audience, and writing in action units. A great resource, probably most of you know this already, but if you haven't been there, plainlanguage.com is a fantastic site uh, for plain writing. It has examples, training, resources, blogs, everything. Make sure to stop by. And here are two more freebies, folks. Uh, just because you attended this webinar with my thanks and gratitude, these are both $50 courses. One is my uh, plain writing course, absolutely free to you. And let me stop my clock here. And the second one, how to use information tables in technical and business writing, again, uh, these coupons will be good for a couple days. So if interested, I would highly recommend for you to go and uh, claim them. And by the way, if you uh, like the courses, uh, please do me a favor of writing a review. If you, if you don't like it, just let me know why so I can uh, improve them. I, I would really appreciate your feedback. Now, here are some more free stuff. Uh, you are welcome to my seven-day technical writing course. It's an introductory course. You are welcome, again, to my YouTube technical business writing channel, absolutely free. Uh, I have a technical writing uh, website with over 2,000 articles, uh, technicalcommunicationcenter.com. And I also have a technical writing core channel, again, absolutely free. Uh, I hope you'll like them. So on uh, maybe not very imaginative, but on Twitter, I'm technical writer. And on Facebook, I'm technical calm. And the best way to reach me is through my email, writer111, gmail.com. And now uh, I am at your command in your service for any uh, questions, comments, suggestions you may have. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ur. Um, if anybody has any questions,
I'd be happy to read off your queries if you put it in the chat. So Judith wants to know if the slide deck will be available for participants. Yes. Uh, yes, definitely. It, it will be available as a PDF document, which includes every slide. I think we have, what, 70, 72 slides, something like that. Yes, definitely. And you can always write to me at writer111 as well. I usually respond within 24 hours. Definitely. Uh, do, do you think uh, the webinar met your expectations? Uh, I, I would be interested in your feedback. Uh, was it too simple, irrelevant? Were there anything new in it for you? What do you think? Okay. Hi, are, this is Anisha. This was really good. I, I thought it was really good and informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. That makes well, are you, you have a comment from Zoya Fansler. Okay. Great. She says, great presentation. I know style guides differ on this point, but what is your opinion on using the Oxford comma? Ah, I do use it. Uh, actually, yeah, I use it consistently. I like it. A, B, comma, N, C, you know, and uh, but it, it's not a from a style point of view. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a, I mean, if somebody convinces me otherwise, I might probably use some other, you know, comma style as well. But yes, I use it because it's the standard, almost traditional thing, even though I, I know about the controversy back and forth. We are like Pepsi and Coke drinkers, right? At each other's throat, whether there should be Oxford comma or not. <laughs> okay. Okay, Jeff Strong. His question is, what software did you use to make the slide interactions? Oh, believe it or not, it's a, a PowerPoint 2019. Uh, it has now a Zoom uh, function. Uh, most people skip over. If you go to the Insert tab, uh, there is a Zoom group. And it's a fantastic, beautiful animation. Uh, because it zooms not only to individual slides, but to whole sections. So like you zoom to one section, you, you go through, as you have witnessed, you go through all the slides in this section, and then it zooms to the beginning of, of the other section after going back to the switchboard. So you, you have this, you know, okay, here it is. Let me show, right, don't tell. Like this is the switchboard, right? So these are all sections. They have multiple slides in it. And like it knows like after going through these slides in the second section, audience analysis, it knows it's gonna go to the third section, et cetera. It, it's, a, it's called Zoom. Very easy to learn and apply. I highly recommend it. Okay. So JC wants to know when the slides will be sent out. JC, I'll send it out to all those that have registered for this event um, after we conclude. Uh, Robert you, Birds. You. Robert? My pleasure. Robert Birds um, says, very well done. Thank and you. And then he learns something every time we have a webinar. And thank you for your comment on the Oxford comma. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and also... And then, Oh, go ahead. If, Sorry. If there are people who are not member of our chapter, Washington DC Baltimore chapter, you should seriously consider it's the award-winning, fantastic chapter, and we work hard and we share a lot. As witnessed uh, tonight, for example, another example, I highly recommend. We have a great job bank, and we we have this Friday events, Monday events. Uh, so. Uh, we would love to see you among us if you are not already a member. Let me plug that in for my chapter, guys. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you. Okay, so Lauren Anthone, great presentation. Can you comment on the use of words like icon, button, et cetera, in procedures? Ooh, okay. Well, uh, uh, Icon is an image, a symbol that stands for a, a concept, a category. 
And for example, at this switchboard page, uh, I use icons. Uh, I wanted to give a visual sense of what I'm talking about. So the topic is, let's say, audience analysis, right? So I said, hmm, audience means more than one person's, and analysis means like maybe they are sitting around the table analyzing something, and boom, that's the image I came across. It was perfect. Uh, I had little difficulty with nominalization. It's not easy to come up with an icon, an image to reflect the essence of the concept of normalization. So I came up with this speech bubble with three dots in it. You know, uh, tables was much more easier, of course. I mean, all you need to do is uh, actually insert the image of a table as an icon. Uh, things to avoid was easy, two eyes watching, you know. Abstract nouns and verbs was tough, but I love uh, Jackson Pollock. I love fine arts. And I said, man, look at this. Looks like a Jackson Pollock splash. And that's pretty abstract, right? So uh, Jackson Pollock is abstract. And I'm talking about abstract nouns. So in my mind, somehow it, it just clicked. I, I used this icon. So uh, does that does that does that answer your question? You ask about icons and what else you ask? You asked about do I use etc. I use at the end of long lists like uh, numbered unnumbered lists and uh, basically I I use it to mean uh, other list members of similar nature uh, because the list. I know I, I can uh, extend it infinitely and I want to cut, cut it at some point. So et cetera comes in really handy uh, at those points. Okay, uh, so Lauren actually sent a follow-up comment. She said, thanks for the icon explanation. What I really wanted to know was your thoughts of writing something like press the help icon, I believe for procedural guides. Press the Lauren, help icon. I think you're unmuted. You can follow. You can follow up verbally. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a very uh, straightforward expression statement. Press the help icon. You can say maybe button. You know, a button usually more often than not is a rectangle as a shape. You know, when I see uh, actually. Like I think Microsoft style guide refers it as a command button. You know, like when you click it, you command it to do something. And if it's not, it doesn't have a traditional rectangle shape, uh, then maybe that's when I, I would be inclined to call it an icon. And I would, in a software documentation, I would use the word click rather than press, because this really what, what you're doing, you're clicking on it. And pressing is uh, some, somewhat has different connotations. And uh, so uh, that's, I, I would say, a pretty much traditional straightforward uh, command, a, a procedural, procedural command. Uh, do you do you think there's anything problematic with it? Uh, I'm trying to understand exactly the re reason why yeah. you asked it. Are there 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 are certain style guides and 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 such that recommend not using any either the word icon or button, but just say you know click the click click help. So that's that's uh, really whittling it down. Because okay. you might be you might be doing a client server application or or a web web server whatever, and when you need to create steps for that, you know it's no longer a button that you're clicking. So yeah, there's there's uh, it, it's a little and this might be outside of the scope of of your uh, webinar here, which I think was 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 very informative, and right. I think for that so just. Let me know if this is, you know, an off-topic kind of thing for you. No, I mean, this is an excellent point, actually, because these days we are writing once and publishing many times, like some, like XML publishing, structured publishing, something may start as a user guide and it may end up uh, on a 
touch screen app at a kiosk at a train station, right? So, uh, I mean, content and form are such separated these days from one another to such a degree that what I call a help button uh, may not be a button at all down on that kiosk, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's a wise point and uh, I'm making a mental note to myself, I should take heed of that too. But luckily, most of the documents I create, uh, they turn into PDF and distribute it as PDF, you know? So, uh, and usually when I say, call something a button or an icon, I am pretty confident that the reader will also see that button or icon on his or her screen, you see? But then I, I, I can imagine, think of quite a few instances where that connection may be lost between the functionality, which is help, and the specific expression of it, the format, visual formatting of it, in terms of maybe it's gonna be an icon, maybe a button, maybe just a text link somewhere. So in those cases, it'll be, I think, safer just to say, uh, click help. So I, I think now I understand your point, correct? I think I get it now. Thank you for asking. It's a good question. Okay, thank you. Mary Beth De Rebeau, forgive me if I did not pronounce that correctly. Um, her comment is, module eight is very relevant to a project I'm working on now. Thank oh. you. I'm wondering oh. if there is preferred terminology for describing how you choose an option. Example, click the button, insert name of button. Click a button versus insert. Those are the then, examples. And, and Mary, feel free to elaborate on this. You're, you're not muted. I mean, click a button is pretty standard. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, click the, and then like the example uh, given earlier, if it's a help button, click the help button or click the next button or click the con uh, continue button or whatever it is. I'm wondering about what the preferred terminology is and some of the um, other comments that are, are coming up are uh, other verbs like press or select and that's exactly what I'm wondering too or tap is another thing because if it's on an I iPad for example you might be tapping not clicking. Wonderful. I mean that's something uh I never wrote, I have to admit, a guide for a pad, iPad, but I'm aware there's swiping and double tapping, et cetera, right? Which brings uh, the, the whole different, uh, st you know, style issue. Uh, I, but I'm not thinking in terms of writing like a click, a help button, uh, I've, I've seen it done both ways. I personally, if I see a button on my screen that says help on it, I just want to be double safe. I can just say click help, uh, but maybe I'm too kind of anal retentive. I want to make sure, you know, the reader won't miss anything. So there's an impulse in me to call it a button, you know. So maybe I'm overdoing it, it's just saying right uh, click help might have been sufficient, but just to be double sure, I mean, I, I'm a guy who arrives three hours early uh, at an airport, you know, my wife can attest to that. So I, I want to be real secure, I want to just nail it down. So uh, th that's why psychologically I feel more secure when I say click the help button, you know. But uh, I've seen people just say in the name of brevity, conciseness, uh, just write, you know, uh, click help and that's it. But uh, it, it opens a whole can of worms if you're writing for the iPad, right? For things with touch screens. And uh, that I had not at rest. And I, I didn't have to, you know, conf confront those questions because as I said, uh, it just turned out that way. No one asked me to write anything for 
uh, iPads or uh, you know smartphones, mobile phones. And uh, so what is valid for uh, print documents or uh, HTML web documents, um, I can see that might not be valid all the time, universally valid for uh, mobile platforms. So uh, I, I guess one needs to have a different set of considerations. Uh, technology is changing all the time. Uh, you know, gadgets are changing. And one needs to have a different set of considerations for such mobile platforms than if you're uh, working on your desktop or laptop and just producing PDFs. Yeah, does that answer your question or? Yes, thank you very much. That You're helps. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Um, Steve also has a comment for you. Okay. He wrote, the bizarre opposite words you mentioned are called contronyms. I just learned about them myself very recently. Correct. Uh, I, I just kind of tongue twister. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, I also uh, found it out rather recently, but still it's a, a amazing thing. Like the only other language I know uh, well is Turkish. And I'm thinking maybe there are, but in, in English there are quite a few of them. You know, <laughs> If you're not careful, uh, the poor translator can go <laughs> right off the tangents, you know. <laughs> So uh, I think I will explore uh, that issue more in the days ahead. It's fun, you know, to find them out. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Sean says, thank you, Uar. And thank Edith, you, <laughs> Edith says, or said, I loved this workshop, very timely. Wonderful. As Wonderful. she's being considered for a demanding tech writer position. Oh. When does the next tech writing seven day workshop start please email with the slides the next chapter meeting date and location okay edith um edith, if you are definitely referring, send that information to you yeah if you are referring to the seven day technical writing course that i mentioned uh it is free it doesn't yes. have a cost. it's online you can okay. go to start take it uh, even uh, even tonight it, okay it is, uh, let me see. Let me put it up for you in closing and some more seven day technical writing course. Uh, you fill it, fill out a form. Okay. Anyway, it's on the, it's a autoresponder system. So once you enter your name and email address, boom, you get, you know, first day's course. And then in the remaining six days, uh, you will get the others. It's an introductory course, but uh, I think, uh, People, students say it still helped them, you know, to uh, kind of get going in the technical writing. Oh, uh, I had one more quick question. Sure. Uh, is there a master list of quote no no words? Uh, I remember I worked on a project years ago, and the prime contractor had certain words. Unfortunately, I cannot find my list. Okay. But I know cer certain words like shall, you don't put into a, a government deliverable. So, okay. yeah, so I was trying to find some place that had no, no words. That's what we call them. <laughs> I mean, probably Sean, who's in this meeting, my friend, he knows a lot about government contracts and uh, uh, requests for proposals, et cetera. May, maybe he may know of such a list. Uh, I personally uh, don't have a list, but I mean, it depends on the specs, right? Specs right. Of, of the proposal, and it varies from one government agency to an, another. But in the books that uh, I introduce, like, uh, uh, let's say, why, why not say it clearly? or Oxford Guide to Plain English, there are a lot of sections, chapters, that uh, talk about similar topics. So right. you can pick up a lot 
uh, yes. by going through a few such good uh, you know elementary texts and right. the, the rest specifics you have to call them up go to their website usually they have spec sheets and uh, uh, that, that should help and uh, uh, I, I don't know Sean if you are there would you like to contribute uh, Sorry, I walked out for just a second and I walked back and people were talking about proposals. So what was the question? So yeah. so I worked on a contract years ago. Uh, the Prime had a master list of what's called, like we call them no-no words. The words yeah. that do not go into deliverables of any documents, not just proposals, but this is more in line when you're, when you're delivering to the client yeah and, and and yeah so we would scrub the documents the words like shall is that's the only way i can think of right now that that are, were part of the no-no list anything no, that was sure. client right yeah uh for sure so in proposals uh when you're actually in the proposal room working one you typically have what's, what you call a wall of truth and it's you know so it's sort of like uh this is what we call our customer so if it's like you know the air force like what part of the air force and you say the air force and how do you uh you know how are you going to make it an acronym that kind of stuff it's sort of like a mini style guide that you work on as the proposal goes on and part of that is we didn't call it a no-no list but it's sort of a do not use uh sort of list and shall is a good one because it's uh it's indicative that you've taken stuff right from the rfp or statement of work and plopped it in without uh much care so i can see why you do that yeah what it, it but it's also for like legal it's, it's also for like legal uh ramifications right sure so, that's why, so you yeah. can say like mm -hmm. if you say we ensure you know from one point of view that's saying that you're absolutely going to right. deliver. from another point of view it just means you know uh <laughs> we want to provide you know what I mean? Or we have a quality exactly. process that backs right. up our ability to do X, Y, Z. Right. You know, something yeah. like that. Yes, right. for sure. You mm. can do that. Thanks, John. Yeah. That's great. I appreciate your, your feedback. Appreciate it. Any more questions, folks? Yes. Uh, you do have some more comments. Okay. Um, and then, Edith, to answer your question about the next chapter meeting, I, I will go ahead and send you some information. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, Cam2Fam says hello from, or said from hello, hello from California. Thank you hello, for the California. valuable information. Thank you. I received your technical writing email. I've been receiving your technical writing email since 2016. Uh, this is his first <laughs> webinar and he's so glad he signed up. Fantastic. Welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Glad to hear that. Okay. And then Ali. Ali, hi. Oh, wait, maybe Allison. She's like, hi, Edith. Uh, we are having a first Friday dinner next Friday at Maggiano's and Tyson's. Follow us on Eventbrite to get updates on all of our events. Thank you, Allison. True. Okay. I'll be there. <laughs> See you there. Um, Robert Birds, Robert Birds said, with the use of several different devices, phones, PCs, or tablets, is the word click being done away with and replaced by the word press? Yeah, I mean, there's a logic to it. I think it makes perfect sense when you're using your cell phone uh, to press it. But as I said, uh, I'm not coming from um, mobile documentation uh, field, uh, and all my career uh, I basically wrote uh, traditional uh, documents, like written documents, and also for the web, when touch screens were not that prevalent, really. Uh, I mean, I've been on the internet since like 92, uh, but relatively recently, um, most of the searches, uh, navigation, downloading, I think it's like 65% right now, uh, people access uh, information. I read it somewhere, more 65% on their phones 
than on traditional desktops and laptops. Uh, clearly, the trend is towards mobile, definitely. And it will, of course, impact and change the way we write you know, uh, our procedural steps. Uh, maybe a time will come when it will be really archaic to say, click anything. Maybe we will just look at it. Maybe even uh, pressing, touching, uh, even maybe they will be obsolete. Uh, I mean, I, I just saw on the TV a handicapped kid. He was operating his computer by just looking with his eyes. He was writing. I guess there was some sort of beam shot at his eye and it was following the di direction of his eyeballs. And uh, maybe we will just talk at one point. Uh, we already are in certain contexts, uh, but everything changes. So uh, yes, I, 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 I would be the last one to say that this is the only way to write something forever. You know, forever yeah. changes very fast these days. <laughs> Can, can I jump in for a second? Because sure. it, it's, it's odd because at the very beginning of when I started tech writing, we mm -hmm. never used click at all or even press. We would say select, you know, and that was like a universal, you, you know, and, and, and the next after select, it would be uh, uh, press, you know, but click was something that people have adopted lately, but again, it's a very, it was more universal because you okay. had screens where you had to touch it and they would say select X, especially when you deal with, with HVAC systems or anything that's mechanical, you're, 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 you were doing touch screens before touch screens got into mainstream computing, right? Okay. So, yeah. I mean, there are different uh, style guidelines uh, for example, I and my team members, we use select and clear only for checkboxes. When you have a checkbox, and I think it comes from Microsoft style guide, you either select it, you don't check it, right? Some people say check, check the checkbox. We say select the checkbox or clear the checkbox. Uh, but that's not the only style guideline. Different companies, clients, agencies have different requirements. Uh, and as, we, as we've been talking uh, last 10, 15 minutes, uh, the platform itself sometimes demands that you change your uh, you know, verbs and nouns. So it is a very dynamic field. And uh, I, I don't think there's a one single universal uh, way of uh, communicating technically. Even if we all agree that we should write plainly, plain writing, still that doesn't solve the problem. You know, we still have to decide whether we're going to say press or swipe or click or whether we're going to call something icon or button. Uh, it's a very dynamic field and that's why I love it. You know, it's you have to be very creative all the time, learn new things and, you know, keep on dancing. You know, yeah. Well said. I believe that that does cover Jamie Stark's question mm -hmm. about whether we should use select versus press, which one is preferable, but you just touched on that yeah. extensively. So I the was, next comment. Well, yeah, depending. It depends. <laughs> okay. The next, pro, the next um, comment is by uh, Andrew Strickland. Okay. And Andrew said, I appreciate all the links to other resources and book recommendations. This was really interesting. Thanks. Um, I thank you too. I appreciate it. Glad you are here. And then Catherine Spivey said, thanks for the plainlanguage.gov shout out. Oh, okay. I mean, I honestly, I, I love that site. It's a wonderful site. Are you related to the site? Uh, just curious. Actually, she... Okay. Jamie what Stark did upload the link. For anyone who's interested in the chat, thank you, Jamie. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful site, plainlanguage.com, gov. Uh, every writer, Chris, yeah, go ahead. Christine Snyder said, thank you so much for this webinar. I'm grateful for the chance to learn from you. Um, go, Christine. <laughs> Robert Bird's actually uploaded a link, 38 words and phrases to avoid in your proposals. Let me just scroll down to the questions. And okay. then he asked.
actually no that was a statement mm -hmm. so i believe that's all that we have for right now okay. um right now it's nine o'clock wow. and i just want to say thank you so much for gracing thank our you. chapter with your knowledge thank we you. truly so appreciate kind. it so and kind. i want to thank all of our guests again we greatly appreciate you and hope that you'll continue to take part in our um, professional development webinar series. Um, please feel free to reach out to me at any time if you, you know, would like to connect. Um, the contact information is on the website. And again, I will forward UAR's um, PDF mm -hmm. presentation via email this evening. So Wonderful. thank you everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Blessings. <laughs> Take you. care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Thank you Bye. This is fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> <Lots of> money. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>